Hi, my name is Mana Parast, and I'm a perinatal pathologist and stem cell scientist at the University of California, San Diego. And today, I'm going to tell you about a very intriguing organ, an organ that none of us would be able to survive the intrauterine period without. And that organ is the placenta. So what is the placenta? It is the connection between mom and baby. It's also known as afterbirth because it's delivered after the baby. And those of us that study the placenta in case, cases of pregnancy complication also know it as a diary of intrauterine life. Now, placenta, the placenta is literally forming a connection between mom and baby. On one side, it's connected to the baby via the umbilical cord. This is the connection through which the baby's blood um, flows into the placenta in order um, for um, it to be loaded up with oxygen and nutrients, and then goes back to the baby. On the flip side, it's attached to mom, and specifically to the uterine lining called decidua. Now, placentas come in all shapes and sizes. This one has the umbilical cord attached to one side. This one seems to have a little bit of extra tissue on the side. This one looks a little pale, maybe a little bit lumpy on the uh, fetal side. And this one looks like it has an abnormal umbilical cord and is a little bit green. So is there a significance to these different shapes and sizes and colors? Well, let's examine them together. So with some of these placentas, what they help us with is to confirm clinical findings. So this placenta with a little bit of extra tissue on the side Actually, what this is is a blood clot that has been accumulating over the period of pregnancy and uh, led to the premature delivery of this placenta at 27 weeks. So this finding actually confirms the clinical diagnosis of chronic abruption. Sometimes um, placentas can provide a hint at a diagnosis of an underlying disease in mom. So when this placenta um, came out, it was associated with uh, a small for gestation baby. On exam, we could see that the placenta shows areas of infarction or dead tissue. And microscopically, this placenta was diagnosed with massive perivillous fibrin deposition. This is a condition that's associated with maternal autoimmune disease, and in fact, this mom went on to be diagnosed with lupus. And this diagnosis came about because of this placental examination. And it's important to, that she received this diagnosis um, at this point in time because for her next pregnancy, she will be able to be treated to prevent um, another instance of intrauterine growth restriction. And other times, placenta can provide a cause of stillbirth. So um, in this case, um, the uh, placenta is shown to have a long, hypertwisted umbilical cord. And placental exam can give us some insight into recurrence of stillbirth in subsequent pregnancies. So with the long umbilical cord, because the length of the cord is at least uh, partly determined by genetics, um, this woman is at a slightly increased risk of having um, stillbirth due to a long cord in a subsequent pregnancy. So what I've shown you is that the placenta can really be the diary of intrauterine life. But more recently, it's been called the least understood human organ by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. And this is, in fact, true as well. We don't really understand how the placenta develops. We don't have a good test to test um, its function during an ongoing pregnancy. And even worse, we don't have any drugs to target the placenta when there is um, 
um, a pregnancy complication. So let me tell you about another devastating disease during pregnancy, which is called preeclampsia. Preeclampsia has also been called the silent killer. The symptoms of preeclampsia develop during the second half of pregnancy, even though the disease is thought to uh, originate early in pregnancy. The symptoms include high blood pressure and um, high protein in, uh, in the urine, or proteinuria, which is a result of kidney dysfunction. But the symptoms can vary. They can range from just uh, pure high blood pressure or gestational hypertension, all the way to eclampsia, where there are seizures, and to HELP syndrome, which um, includes liver failure and clotting disorders. Preeclampsia happens in 5 to 8 percent of pregnancies worldwide. Other than maternal complications, there is also neonatal complications, the most common of which is intrauterine growth restriction. There is no cure for preeclampsia except delivery, and as a result, it's the leading cause of preterm uh, deliveries. A placenta from a, a preeclamptic placenta shows a lot of pathology. So what you see here is a placenta um, with an infarct or an area um, of dead tissue. In addition, uh, these placentas show evidence of maternal vascular disease, um, as is evident on the clinical side by high blood pressure in mom. But even around the infarction or the dead tissues, the um, placenta under the microscope appears very abnormal. Basically, it shows evidence of abnormal placental development. And we're not clear as to how this happens. In order to better understand this disease, we have to understand placental development better. Now, the placenta develops um, from the um, embryo, from in particular, from the outer cells of an embryo that um, are called trophoblasts. This outer layer of cells, uh, the trophoblasts, proliferate, expand, and differentiate in order to um, give rise to the placenta at term. The word trophoblast comes from the Greek word trophō, meaning to feed. And in fact, this is the primary um, function of these cells in order to be able to access maternal blood and then provide it to the growing placenta and therefore the fetus. The trophoblasts begin um, at a progenitor um, cell called a cytotrophoblast, or CTB, and they have to differentiate into two different subtypes. One is extravillous trophoblast, or EVT, and the other is a multinucleated syncytiotrophoblast, or STB. Now, EVT, extravillous trophoblast, develop early in pregnancy, and they're perhaps the most crucial to pregnancy success. So before pregnancy, the maternal vessels look like this. They are basically very small, and they can carry very little uh, blood uh, to, um, to a growing baby. However, um, in, during the first trimester of pregnancy, the extravillous trophoblasts actually invade and remodel maternal vessels, thereby allowing these vessels to carry more blood to the growing um, fetal placental unit. The syncytiotrophoblast develop in functional units of the placenta called the chorionic villi. This is where the gas and nutrient exchange actually happens. These units um, are comprised of fetal blood vessels in the middle and a layer of cytotrophoblast, and these progenitor cells then fuse to form the multinucleated syncytiotrophoblast. Syncytiotrophoblast um, secrete the pregnancy hormone, HCG, and they are the cells that are responsible for gas and nutrient exchange. 
If either one of these cell types doesn't differentiate properly, the result is abnormal placental development. So if the extravillus trophoblast, or EVT, don't differentiate well, the placenta doesn't receive enough maternal blood. If the syncytiotrophoblasts, on the other hand, don't differentiate properly, that results in improper or insufficient gas and nutrient exchange. Both of these can result in placental diseases, including preeclampsia and intrauterine growth restriction. So in summary, the placenta, as I've explained, is a diary of intrauterine life. Placental examination can um, not just confirm clinical findings, but it can also identify underlying maternal disease. It can provide a cause for unexplained stillbirth. I've also explained that abnormalities in placental development can lead to pregnancy complications, including preeclampsia and IUGR. And I've also summarized the development of placental cells, or trophoblast, specifically from a cytotrophoblast progenitor state into either extravillus trophoblast, or EVT, which are in invasive cells that help access maternal blood, or syncytiotrophoblast, or STB, which are multinucleated cells which help in gas and nutrient exchange. I hope you stay tuned for the second part of the talk, where I'm going to discuss how we can model and better understand human placental development.